Hello and welcome to episode 212 of Stand Up. Joining me today, environmental expert, sustainability expert, government and democracy expert, the great Dr. David Orr joins me from Oberlin College in Ohio, and my friend, comedian, activist, and advocate, Maizun Zaid as well. I am Pete Dominic. It is time to stand up with me right now. Hello and welcome to the show, which I post every day by 4 a.m. And talk to the smartest people I can find every single day. Can't do it without your support because it's not free. Over 750 people now with paid subscriptions for this show. And thank you guys very much. Several coming in over the weekend. I'll read a bunch of them on tomorrow's show. If you want to get your name read, subscribe now for as little as $5. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. And thank you very much for being a part of our community. If you are a part of the community, we are now meeting and always talking on the Discord platform, which is very cool. I've been mentioning it here, I think, all of last week. Some people are confused about how to get there. If you are a subscriber and you get the Patreon email or just go to your Patreon account, there should be directions there to get the Discord on every day's show post. I'll include that to make it as clear as possible. If you're still having issues, you can message me on Patreon or email me, standupwithpete at gmail.com. And that is growing every day. More and more people trying to connect there 24-7. I'd love to see you in the Discord chat or not. If you just want to listen to the podcast, or just want to support it, thank you very much. Lots to talk about with you before I get to my first couple of guests. There are 16 days that separate us uh, from the time I'm taping this and Election Day. Hopefully you're listening to it, I guess, I guess 15 days before November 3rd, 2020. How are you feeling about the election? 28 million Americans have already voted. I think that might be a record for modern voting history. I'm not sure. What are you thinking? It seems to be slipping away from Donald Trump every day. He is out there on the campaign trail and he's not doing himself any favors at any of these speeches, but he is panicking and throwing all kinds of crazy shit out into the ether. What effect does it have when he tweets and shares and talks about all of these crazy conspiracy theories that are absolutely impossible to believe from QAnon to bin Laden's body double to you name it. It's out there. He just puts it out there. He just does not care. What do you think about the effect that it has on us before the election and potentially permanently as well? When you see how twisted so many folks have gotten away from reality, it really is terrifying. All right. I'll be talking to a lot of great guests this week. And looking forward to talking to you as well in a Zoom hangout. I'm not sure what day I'll be doing that. I uh, hope to post the teacher show this week. I'm going to talk again with Pam Keith. I've got conversations with Ali Velshi and so many more experts that will be joining me this week. So thank you very much for tuning in. Okay, a couple things I wanted to mention. I wanted to share this ad with you, and I hope all of your friends in Michigan and everywhere else will share it as well. Anybody who is in live performance, live music, live comedy, etc., knows that venues that host this kind of performance on college campuses in small towns and big cities are struggling. And a national TV ad airing Sunday from Democrat Joe Biden's campaign focused on the Blind Pig, which is this historic concert venue in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where the University of Michigan is, to criticize President Trump's response or lack of response to COVID-19. The ad, according to the Detroit, Detroit News, comes a day after Trump visited Michigan, touting his belief that the nation's economy will soon boom again and 16 days before the November election. Uh, November 3rd election. Both campaigns have concentrated more resources on Michigan. I think this is the type of ad that will be really effective, especially because it was played during NFL games, which matters a lot. But this ad, this Joe Biden ad was played one of four distinct campaign ads during NFL games yesterday. It's called The Blind Pig. I've linked to it in the show notes, and here it is. But this is, by the way, the first time the Beastie Boys has ever licensed music for a political ad, apparently, according to uh, Ed O'Keefe. Here's the ad, the audio, the video is even, of course, better. 
everywhere I go, people have a story about the Blind Pig. The Blind Pig has been one of those clubs that attract artists from all genres. For 50 years, the Blind Pig has been open and crowded. But right now, it's an empty room. This is the reality of Trump's COVID response. We don't know how much longer we can survive not having any revenue. A lot of restaurants and bars that have been mainstays for years will not make it through this. This is Donald Trump's economy. There's no plan and you don't know how to go forward. It makes me so angry. My only hope for my family and for this business and my community is that Joe Biden wins this election. That's the kind of person we need. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. You know, Joe Biden may look uh, and seem old at times, but whenever, as he is in that video, he's running around, running upstairs with those Ray-Ban aviator sunglasses, he looks like a pretty cool old dude to me, a pretty strong old dude as well. All right, so I go from there to wanting... Here's another, just, I think, clip I wanted to play for you because I think this scientist explains really well, very articulately, the difference between the flu and COVID-19. Listen to Dr. Hugh Montgomery speaking to the UK's Channel 4 News. Normal flu, if I get that... I'm going to infect, on average, about 1.3, 1.4 people, okay, if there was such a division. Yeah. And if those 1.3, 1.4 people gave it to the next lot, that's the second time it gets passed on. By the time that's happened 10 times, I've been responsible for about 14, 1, 4 cases of flu. This coronavirus is very, very infectious, so every person passes it to three. Now, that doesn't sound like much of a difference. But if each of those three passes it to three, and that happens at 10 layers, I have been responsible for infecting 59,000 people. Now... I actually wasn't on top of that maths <laughs> when you are doing that. Okay, that, that did come as a shock, yeah. Right. Now, most people are going to feel a bit pokey, or not very pokey, and be just fine, but they will have spread, a, spread it around. And a few will get sick at about day 10 of their illness. So they will need to come to a hospital. And when they're in a hospital, they will consume resources and time and people will look after them quite rightly. And they will be monitored to see if they become really, really sick. Those people then come to an intensive care unit. And that's where, if you're critically ill, your life gets saved or not. And this is the issue. If we've got a limited resource, which we have, a limited number of ventilators, a limited number of doctors, a limited number of nurses, which is fine because we can't run ourselves with a huge excess capacity all the time. If we overwhelm that, we can't provide that service of caring for these people properly. This isn't the end of the world, is it? No, we've got to remember that this is, I'm not, not going to play it down. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be horrible for a large number of people, but it will be a small number of people who get properly sick and a smaller percentage of those again that need to come to an intensive care unit. And we can save the lives of a large number of those people too. But please just remember that the best chance we can give for the people who do fall ill is if we've got enough beds and enough staff and enough kit to be able to be there for you. And if you are irresponsible enough to think that you don't mind if you get the flu, remember, it's not about you. It's about everybody else. That's Dr. Hugh Montgomery on Channel 4 News in the UK. I just thought that was a good clip. I don't know if I needed the dramatic music, but I didn't add it. That was theirs. All right. Well, it's the home stretch of the presidential campaign and the U.S. coronavirus caseload trending ominously upward in case you're not paying attention what do you think how we're doing in terms of how the presidential campaigns are taking a look at that, how the federal government is dealing with it, and how state governments are dealing with it as well? We have 39 million global cases confirmed, 1 million, over 1 million global deaths, U.S. cases 8 million, 8.1 million, and U.S. deaths now 219,669 as of Sunday night late on the 18th of October. Oh, also the Washington or the Wall Street Journal and I guess the Washington Post are reporting that the Sturgis motorcycle rally that took place a couple of weeks ago uh, back in the Dakotas drew half a million bikers 
uh, from Wyoming, Minnesota, and Montana, and those states are now leading the nation in new coronavirus infections per capita. So did the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally spread coronavirus across the Midwest? That is a question that is tough to answer, but seems likely, seems very likely, and you could have predicted that. Also, I saw this and thought it was funny. A tweet from reporter Olivia Nuzzi covering the president said that in uh, in Carson City, Nevada, he's running all over the place between now and Election Day. Trump is uh, that uh, Donald Trump apparently said if Joe Biden wins, the Christmas season is going to be canceled. He's going to cancel Christmas. And Jack Hamilton on Twitter quoted that saying, sad if it's true, but still not a bad trade off, which I thought was funny. You know, I'd hate to see the Christmas season canceled, whatever that means. But I would also much, much be uh, be much more disappointed if Trump gets reelected. So I like that and wanted to share it with you. J.L. Covan tweets, I want Joe Biden to expand the court by four seats and add Hillary, Barack, Merrick Garland and Hunter Biden to the court, which I think is really funny. I also think it's funny that you've got uh, Trump and all of his supporters in right wing media and including in the U.S. Senate like Ron Johnson talking about this conspiracy theory about Hunter Biden and his laptop computer and what they found on it. And it's just absolutely nuts. Comedian Jay Black tweeted, my dog just dug up a thumb drive in my backyard that used to belong to Hunter Biden. Guys, it is not good. Biden and Hunter are building a solar powered Antifa robot. Worse, they're planning to put AOC's brain in it so she can socialism forever. Very funny, Jay. Jay is very funny on Twitter, my friend. Jay Black is funny. That's his Twitter handle. Anyway, if people are, are going nuts, including Rudy Giuliani about Hunter Biden. And, and most of this stuff is there are grains of truth to it. Uh, he did not get three point five million dollars from the former mayor of Ms., uh, Moscow's wife. That has not been proven. And the Senate Intel Committee, the Republicans led that knew that they didn't find anything. Uh, this is all just a, a, a big distraction. And the idea that Hunter Biden traded on his dad's name, like pretty much every other human being does, it looks bad. It's not great. But if you follow all these threads, they lead to nothing. And the president just keeps throwing shit out there as much as he can to distract you and confuse us about what is real and what is not. But I mean, just watching people get upset about anything that Joe Biden's son did while Donald Trump appointed his own kids to key positions in the White House, in his administration. It's crazy. If you're upset about Hunter Biden, then you've got to be outraged about Ivanka and Jared Kushner and everything that Eric and Don Don Jr. are doing. I mean, you just have to be. You can't. The comparison does not exist. They're not. They're worlds apart. And I think that's the thing that frustrates me the most when I argue with folks about this stupid issue, which I don't spend a lot of time doing because this whole Hunter Biden thing is a dumb distraction. Just a few weeks, uh, less than a few weeks before Election Day now. All right. Let me get to my first guest. I got to get this uh, podcast posted away and had an awesome conversation with David Orr. Last week, what can I say about David Orr and his introduction? This guy is an environmental uh, sustainability expert and professor and has been for over 30 years. He has worked with presidential administrations, colleges, state and federal governments. Uh, He has got like eight honorary degrees. I met him when I was talking to young people at an environmental conference years back And I was absolutely blown away watching him speak. I got his books right away, including Hope is Imperative uh, is an imperative. I highly recommend that book. But he's written uh, eight books in total. He served as a board member or advisor on many foundations. And his new initiative, which I was at the launch for at Oberlin College, is called The State of American Democracy. They have an awesome YouTube series Also, there is a great book along with it called Democracy on Chain, How to Rebuild Government for the People, a stellar group of America's leading political thinkers exploring how to reboot our democracy. I highly recommend all of it. And the show links to there are links to it in the show links is what I'm trying to say. Here is my conversation, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And I think you will as well with Dr. David Orr, who I called as he was walking out of the voting booth last week. And we continue the conversation later. Here it is. Hello. David Orr. This is David Orr. I just voted. 
I'm walking out of the polling place. That's <laughs> awesome. Can you tell me about your experience I'm recording? You're in Ohio. It is uh, crowded. This course, pre-election, it is crowded. Long line here. Uh, wait time wasn't too bad, but it was. Uh, people are here in numbers, and this is a pretty heavily Democratic uh, area, so I think it's going to go pretty strong for Biden. When you say when you hear that there are large numbers of people voting early, waiting in long lines, does that make you think it benefits one side or the other? Or does it matter based on the the polling place in the state? Boy, Pete, this is such a toss up. There's so many inflamed opinions. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and and Trump has worked his demonic magic on a lot of people who have belief that somehow he's uh, now immune to COVID and he's making America great and draining the swamp and so forth. And so many inflamed opinions. And of course, Fox News, that is half of the TV news watchers, I guess, is a huge part of the problem of misinformation. Yeah. There's, there's so many X factors. I mean, he knows a lot better than I do, but with Russians in the shadows and all this misinformation and QAnon, I mean, it's a crazy time in American history. But we hope that uh, things prevail and people settle down and just pay attention to facts and logic and data and, uh, you know, draw on their best instincts, the angels of their better nature. Is America history? Well, it, it's, it's a crazy time in American history, but probably also world history. I mean, we're seeing the same democratic disarray in European countries. And uh, so th this is just a... Uh, Awkward time, and the old institutions have let us down. Is it okay if we keep talking? Well, this, you sound great, but I know. Do you want to wait and call me back? Because I know you're on the move. Hey, your your call. I'm walking to a car. I'll be home in about twenty minutes. But uh, your call. Well, you don't want to do this while you're driving, right? You want me to call you back uh, when I get home? If it's okay, I mean, I just yeah. I don't want to I don't want to put the great David Orr in danger. That would that's my, <laughs> my my goal is to learn from you, not kill you. <laughs> Well, you know, there'd be a lot of people that would appreciate uh, the former. Stop it. Uh, call me when you get, call me as soon as you get home and we'll keep talking for as long as you I'll have. Do Looking I'll do forward. it. I got All time. Right. Awesome. All right. Bye. All right. Thanks, Pete. Yep. David Orr. Hey, Pete. Sorry to mess you up here this morning. Hope it didn't cause you too much trouble. Well, I uh, was supposed to be out in the garden by now. <laughs> well. <laughs> so you laugh well, you laugh but I look at the garden that. waiting for me and it's beckoning me to come and harvest the final buds of the year thank you very much for making time for me it's great to hear your voice your voice is like a uh, it's like reading your work but with a voice <laughs> well listen I'm sorry if the garden if the calls from your garden get too loud go ahead and we can talk later so no no interrupt the guy in the garden no, you know, the next person I'm actually talking to, and I'm recording this now, uh, so say what you will about uh, this bastard Richard Louvre. I'm talking to him later. Terrible guy. Rich, Rich is a really good guy. He's <laughs> a good writer, and he's uh, I'm on his board. I don't add much to his board, but he said uh, he writes good books. They're readable. And what he did was to go off into something that was – not terribly political. It's kids and getting kids back in nature and yeah. everybody from left to right and everybody in between can agree that that's a good thing to do. He's, and, yeah. Yeah. Rich is uh, one of my favorite people on the planet. You tell him hello for me. I will. He's one of my favorite people on the whole planet. And you are one of mine as well. And I haven't talked to you in a long time. I look at you and I think that you're probably so busy talking to people and doing all that you can to help make the world a better place. Uh, but I, I think of you often, I think mainly because of your work and your books that I sit around and read and reread. And I'm very happy to be talking to you today. And I want to talk about the initiative that you and others launched back at, shortly after the election, the state of American democracy, which began yep. with a conference, which I attended yep. out there at Oberlin. It was really interesting to be there. I talked to a whole bunch of people that were in attendance, that were speaking, that are there trying to solve the big problems uh, in the country and the planet. And then it went to a book. It's now uh, a book and a video series that is out. And both are so high quality, excellent and really important 
And I wanted to just have you tell me a little bit about this entire initiative, which started with the conversation because you have, as Jane Meyer of The New Yorker says, uh, America's smartest minds on speed dial. What what were you trying to achieve and why did you launch this initiative? Well, it, it was really Pete out of dismay. The, the country uh, had been stumbling along for 40 or 50 years and Trump was a reflection or the result of a whole lot of things that had happened. But uh, this part of it goes back to Reagan, uh, the war against government, this 40 year war against government. Now we find out during a COVID pandemic, you better have a government and it better be effective and it better be competent people. And so it's like a spare tire. These federal agencies that when you call 911, you hope somebody picks up the phone and they're competent and they can help mm. deal with your rising sea levels or the hurricane or the tornado that just swept uh, you know your town away. But 40 years we've had that. Or a virus. And even, yeah, and, and even before that, uh, the government was kind of a hit and miss thing. Americans had this love-hate relationship with this thing called government. And uh, Jefferson's old thing about the government that governs best governs least. Well, that may have worked in the 18th century and for a while in the 19th century. And it started coming apart in the 20th century. In the 21st century, it's it's just baloney that we need competent federal agencies that do things. And they need to op- operate within the guardrails of the Bill of Rights and so forth. But this 40-year war it, it is basically a reflection that the Republicans didn't want uh, regulation, didn't want people looking over their shoulders, didn't want to tell be told to clean up their air and water and they couldn't abuse people and they had to have safe workplaces and all these kind of things that government agencies are chartered to do. And so we started in, in 2017 with this conference at Oberlin that you mentioned. 32 speakers in three days uh, started with people like Tim Egan and Jane Mayer and ended with uh, William Barber. Barber's talk, as you recall, was like an exclamation mark at the end of the sentence. Yeah. Uh, smart, emphatic. He knew his history and he brought the whole thing down that democracy is about, it, it's a moral issue. It's how we define who we are as a people and how we're governed and to what effect, what do we do as a nation? Uh, and that's got to be democratically determined. So we've got to learn to be citizens again. Uh, the book the um, that came out after this, Democracy Unchained, is 30 Nine authors, very prominent in their field, people like Bill McKibben and Jessica Tuckman Matthews and so forth, uh, writing original essays. And where the conference was looking through the rearview mirror, asking, how did we get here? The book is looking through the front uh, windshield, saying, where do we go and how do we get there? And so uh, it uh, came out in March, and we <laughs> we had planned 14 live events starting at the National Cathedral. Ah, okay, right. Yes, I remember that now. And because Followed yeah. by an event at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, but 14 events across the country, uh, Washington, D.C., the National Cathedral, to the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, to the New England Aquarium, down in Montgomery, Denver, Los Angeles. I mean, we were going all over and taking teams of the authors to speak. And then Two weeks before the cathedral event, it looked like we were going to have a full crowd at the cathedral. Uh, COVID struck. uh, We had to cancel everything. And so we made the pivot as everybody else has had to do to online events. So uh, their plan, we planned 10 of those. We, the fifth goes online uh, tonight, seven o'clock Eastern time. And it's on corruption at the state and local level. Uh, and then the next one is the second piece on corruption uh, next week. But we're, we're starting a larger, deeper conversation about democracy. How do we make it work? And this isn't a return to some previous set point of you know, democracy in 1955, right. or 1985 or right. whatever. It's democracy, Pete, for the first time. We've never really had it. We've dabbled hmm. at it. Uh, we've gradually pushed the boundaries and so forth. We added more people to the, the roles. But America began with crime. We began by taking land from Native people and uh, didn't compensate them, moved them off, killed a whole lot of them. And then secondly, uh, slavery and a good bit of the wealth accumulated was the theft from the uh, taken from slaves. And then we never really resolved that. And so to be fully democratic, right. we have to rethink a whole lot of things. Right. Uh, last week's program was on reparations, a complicated subject and loaded. There are people who hate it, but uh, the point we were trying to make is that reparations somehow undoing the effects of past uh, sins or 
failures and mistakes. Also needs to apply to people in West Virginia, hills and hollows, whose mountains got knocked off by uh, coal mining companies and people who've been mm. disadvantaged over the years in other ways. And then also we need to begin thinking about uh, reparations as a forward looking thing. Also, uh, we're leaving a hellacious climate behind for yeah. our kids and grandkids and theirs. And we need to start paying the full price of what the things that we consume, uh, in that case, energy. So, And I, I just want to take a, a just a quick pause, David, to just mention that the fact that you had to adapt like everybody else to a video series uh, sucked. Mm -hmm. uh, but the video series that you created, I've been watching it. It's really well done. It's very high quality. Anybody who listens to this podcast will uh, greatly enjoy Democracy Unchained, a conversation series. Of course, I'll link to the exact place to get to it in the show notes. But like uh, David just said on episode five and talking about this most recent one, and I think that's where I, I jumped in and interrupted you to plug the series. Well, th thanks for that. I really appreciate that. There are seven roughly hour long episodes up to the election. And the seventh one begins to make the pivot to how do we build a bridge to a better future? And so we focus on education and democracy and, and things of that sort. They're longer term. But we've, uh, we've got an all-star cast. Every, every one of these programs, we've got uh, oh, yeah. people we're filming today, Russ Feingold and Trevor Potter. I and mean, we've got, got amazing people. And then after the election, uh, we want to do a week to <laughs> stop and see what happens. The president has been threatening uh, uh, to do all kinds of things if the election doesn't right go his way. And uh, so there is the threat of violence hanging over the election, the yes. threat of Russian interference and right. so forth. We've never seen this in American politics before. Not like this. This is the worst we've ever had in our 230 years of history as a nation. So we'll take a break uh, and then we'll resume on uh, November 12th. And if, if there is a peaceful succession more or less underway, then the questions come up where we want to ask, how do we rebuild our capacity to protect air, water, land, biodiversity, and climate stability? We've lined up four EPA directors for that program and lots of other really smart people. The one after that is on rethinking the architecture of governance. How do we build a government that is calibrated the way nature works physically? How do we make an effective government that works with natural systems, not against it? Right. So that, that'll include lawyers, uh, some people from Native American legal backgrounds, uh, some earth system scientists and so forth. But we need to get we need to begin to rethink. We need big ideas here to reorient ourselves to the act of governing that is fair and decent and farsighted and wise and also uh, includes uh, everybody genuinely democratic. And that would be uh, democracy, I think, for the first time. Yeah. Wow. You make a lot of really, really great points right here at the top. I'm trying to pick which one I kind of want to, what direction I want to go in with you as I further the conversation here. But, you know, you are mostly giving us an overarching idea of the work that the State of American Democracy Initiative has been and talking about what you're doing and, and laying out what's to come. And I'm, I'm so glad that you did. It's, I, I like that you're taking a break after the election and that you'll pick up this conversation with these brilliant people. State of American Democracy dot org, by the way. But you yourself are a person who has created and crafted and implemented big ideas on many of the big problems. You and I met at an environmental conference for, for young people, and you have been talking about teaching uh, and advising people on sustainability issues and issues of envir all environmental issues for over 30 years. So you've also been ringing the alarm bell for a long time as well now about climate and before that other environmental issues. Could we just pick up specifically on where you think we're at, because this is such a difficult problem to solve, but it was a difficult problem to solve pre Donald Trump and the election of 2016. How do you frame, and maybe I can put uh, some alarm sound effects behind you. How do you use words to explain where we're at with the climate emergency? Boy, Pete, it, it's tough because we're visual creatures and something I've been told like 70 or 80 percent of our sensory apparatus is in our eyes. And so we were inclined to believe what we see most. Hmm. And that's why television and movies are such powerful things. But 
but we're also moved by words uh, and by visual stimuli that's like art. Um, and we're, you know, we we uh, we believe what we're told, and so the ears are important here also. Pete, I think the best way to frame this is just start where we are right now. The COVID pandemic hit, and it was a predictable event. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, uh, we we knew from books back in the uh, oh, late '80s and up through the mid '90s that there were we, we were going to face a pandemic. And more Sorry, importantly, Gary, just real quick, there are people who are called epidemiologists, virologists, who study this stuff all day, every day for years. They've had careers. They have been predicting it. They have been warning it. They have been working to try to protect us from it and carry on, sir. Sorry. I mean, the whole field of study has been predicting it. No, that, that, that's right. And it's interesting. If you look at the COVID thing, it, it's a preview of what climate change is going to be. You asked about climate change. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's it going to be like? How do we how do we understand this? Uh, and words don't convey it entirely. So our experience of COVID the death rate, we're now up to what, nearly 220,000 deaths and so forth. We're told it's going to go to four, five, or 600,000, or maybe even more than that if let Trump have his way. So, but but it, it's it's interrupted every phase of our life. It's interrupted supply chains from Europe. It's, it's put businesses out of business. It is infected. Uh, we're, what, seven or eight million people infected with this thing now. And so it, it, it's a preview of what climate change will be like. Only the difference is it's confined to one area. I mean, it's it's a uh, health issue. Um, it is uh, short term. We'll, we'll get through this, and one way or another, we'll find a way past COVID. There'll be a vaccination that works, and so forth. Um, and it will not wreak the havoc that climate change will. Climate change come full bore at. Uh, much beyond two degrees centigrade warming, right. things really come unraveled. And as we've seen, Jim Hansen sent out a paper I got yesterday saying that mm. global warming is actually proceeding much faster than it, it was previously. And so uh, when global warming passes some threshold that no one knows for sure that is irreversible, it will be just hell on earth. We just will have to ride it out and uh, whatever human survivors uh, make it, then, you know, that, that'll that'll be the end of it. But we've got to interrupt this and try to understand what it's going to be like. Take COVID and multiply it by a thousand. Climate change will be effectively permanent. It'll affect uh, everybody everywhere on the planet one way or another. Rising sea levels will impact the coastal communities. Bigger storms impacts everybody from the coastal areas to big tornadoes and what they call derechos sweeping across the middle of this country. Uh, fires in California. I mean, you begin to you can begin to see the unfolding drama of climate chaos. And now we've been warned about this. We've known about this for decades, long, long time ago. And uh, the first science was really confirmed back in 1898 by a Swedish scientist, uh, Savetti Arrhenius. And from that work, and then later work, and we, it was like seeing pixels in a in a frame of a picture starting to get more and more clear. And there is no there's no rational dispute. So in Amy Coney Barrett yesterday at the hearings in, under the Judiciary Committee for the Supreme Court nomination said she didn't really know much about climate. That mm. is criminal. She should not be yeah. on a court. She should know what planet she intends to practice law on. I mean, well, no, uh, Kamala, Harris, biosphere. Kamala Harris cleverly asked her a series of questions. I want to get your take on it, which was. She asked her about what she thought about the science regarding tobacco and uh, also about, I think, infectious diseases. And then she asked her about climate. And that's where she begged off and said, listen, that's, you know, an issue where people, you know, reasonable people can disagree. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But my understanding is yeah. that there's a lot more evidence and science of man's role in climate, of the fact that greenhouse gases are throwing our planet the way that we're consuming way off and creating this climate emergency. There's more evidence on that, more science on that than there is on tobacco causing cancer. So it's it, the, the point just to make it easier for people to understand. You can't say you. Well, of course, these these two problems are solved. We understand there's no there's no debate about tobacco, but on climate there is. And uh, you're yeah. understand. I mean, there isn't right. I mean, the science is very conclusive on this issue. There, there's no scientific debate anymore. I mean, there's no more here in this instance. There is about the laws of gravity. Uh, I mean, it, it's a you, know, you release things uh, in a gravity field, and they'll they'll 
fall. They'll fall to the center. And then climate change, put heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere, they'll trap heat. Put a lot of them there, they trap a whole lot of heat. And some of those heat-trapping gases stay up there for a long time. Uh, methane rather short-lived, but has a heat-trapping capacity roughly 80 times molecule for molecule than CO2. But the fact is that we should not be debating this, and we shouldn't be debating a Supreme Court member uh, admission to the Supreme Court unless somebody knows what uh, is going on on the planet. And, you, you know, back on originalism uh, for a minute. She claims to be an originalist, but mm. I'd pose the question differently. If the founders knew then, in, say, 1787, what we know now about how Earth works as a physical system, how would they then have written a constitution for a world of leads and lags and stocks and flows and feedback and long time horizons and ecological systems that are sometimes like hair triggers? You mess up too much and you, you get a terrible disaster. Right. That would have been an interesting exercise, not, not to their fault. They just didn't know that, but we now do. So what does that original document uh, say to a world now of seven and a half billion people loaded with viruses uh, and with a biosphere uh, and a whole lot of geochemical cycles of materials and so forth. That's the world we live in. And for her to say she doesn't know much about that, that is grounds right there to say you don't qualify for the Supreme Court. But if you gave the same test to the other members of the Supreme Court, only a couple of them would likely pass it. So one of the great challenges is to recalibrate our governance and our legal system to the way Earth works as a physical system hmm. and also as a moral system. But that, that's an ongoing challenge. We, we had to do that with lots of things. As, as, we, as science progressed, we learned lots about how the world works, and we gradually accommodated. We, we moved our, the science of our transportation from a horse and buggy to uh, you know Priuses and, and complicated cars and electric vehicles and uh, you know, Teslas and so forth. I mean, our, we, we adapted to what we learned, but we haven't adapted to what we know now. And it's assumed by a lot of people, well, environment's just a separate issue. No, no, it, it is the issue. It, it's the issue that it is a, what they call existential. We get it wrong. We don't exist. Right. And, and so, so I, I just wanted to ask you just though about that. I mean, I hear what you're saying and I appreciate it so much about having to recalibrate our laws, our economy about, Earlier, you mentioned having an effective government that works with nature's actual systems. I I read that. I buy it. I understand it. But it's still you're still you still have to uh, win an argument and convince the public that this direction is better than that direction. And my specific question is the best way to do that isn't by reading or talking to David or attending this conference, reading the book, watching the videos. Although those kinds of things obviously influence my thinking because it's such brilliant people talking about them. The best way to actually win an argument about which direction to go forward, and I would imagine this is probably true of most human civilization, is as you said earlier, you put something before people, before their eyes, and you say, this way is better. So specifically what I mean is, and how much hope do you have, you pay close attention to energy systems, that we're in a place where People, consumers will say, oh, this way is better in terms of, let's say, a cheaper, more affordable form of energy, meaning I don't want a gas car anymore. I don't want to power my home yeah. off of fossil fuels because this way is cheaper, not better, cheaper, because morality doesn't necessarily win an argument, but a lower price for energy often does. Where are we at with energy? Can the market solve some of this just by being very competitive? Well, I think the answer is is yes. The problem is the timing of it. If we had 200 years to make a transition to a clean energy future, I, I'd say, hey, just let the market do it. We don't have 200 years. We don't even know if we have 10 years, to be frank. And so the the plan, I said the best plan would harness <clears throat> that element of greed and self-interest for sure. But also the guys that went and fought our parents and grandparents that went and fought in World War II and fought on those little islands in you know, the Pacific and fought in Europe and so forth. They didn't do that because it was going to make them money. They did that because they were patriots. It right. was the right thing to do. And a lot of them volunteered for things that were tough to do. Uh, the British built a whole empire on service. Not uh, Those guys didn't make a whole lot of money. Some people did, but the people that actually did the empire building didn't make much money. A lot of them died in the process. 
Now, well, it's a good thing, and I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it was it was people do things for all kinds of reasons, motivations, right? And we shouldn't we shouldn't dismiss. I mean, parents raise kids and spend hours and years raising up good kids and you know, spending money to do this, not because it makes them money, but because it's the right thing to do, and they love their children. So the idea of dusting off this old virtue of patriotism is not 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 a bad idea. Hmm. But if it also coincides, as it does in this case, with the right thing to do is the smart thing to do. So you, you've got this convergence of the right thing to do is economically is to build energy efficient houses and buildings and so forth and drive energy efficient cars. And if you don't need it, don't buy it. Uh, but it's also uh, it's also the right thing to do. So it, it's one of these rare times when the right thing and the smart thing converge. It's the right thing to do. For example, in uh, we, we just did a, a couple of fly, drone flyovers of the campus here at Oberlin. And the Lewis Center we built 20 years ago. It opened 20 years ago, 21 years ago almost. Powered entirely by sunshine. Produces every year an annual surplus of uh, electricity from what it uses to heat, ventilate, light, and air condition, and so forth, of around anywhere from 20 to 45 percent. And that building is 21 years old, hmm. and it works fine. Uh, we built an 11-acre solar array that, if we uh, five or six years ago, if we did the same array this summer, it would come in at about a third the cost that we paid five or six years ago but even then it was a good thing to do i mean it, it was economically a good right, thing to do. right so can the country with leadership uh get off carbon fuels get off combustion have a great life do everything that we want to do but do it with efficiency accommodation efficiency better design renewable energy and whether it's solar electricity or wind power biomass whatever the answer is yes the the, the, the missing thing isn't technology it isn't economics. It's leadership. Leadership. Yeah. Well, that's why let's talk about it then, because as much as you know about ecology and sustainability and, and you also know about government and leadership because you've worked with literally the greatest leaders in your generation. So many of them and you're a very modest guy. But uh, if we name the names, you, you, you know, you know, a lot of titans. You've influenced them with your ideas. The problem I see going back to what you said earlier um, to some extent is when you talked about regulation, when you talked about government and, and it functioning correctly, w w there's a struggle for the minds of citizens in our society. And it is being won by uh, a right wing media ideology that is pervasive across all media, including new media. And how does a leader come into power and combat what we have here, which is a, a, a thriving multi-billion dollar industry of right wing media that began, of course, with Rush Limbaugh and Roger Ailes and Fox News and is now mm -hmm. being led by a lot of young people like someone like Ben Shapiro influencing minds. They're not having a conversation like the ones that you've always been in, a thoughtful, nuanced conversation with experienced, credible, moral people. They're having a conversation that drives ratings, that makes money for advertisers and subscriptions, and they are kicking ass. How does a leader come in and in any way combat the influence of those ideas, which have now become, as you know, insane conspiracy theories about you know, baby's blood. Mm -hmm. Well, Pete, uh, I just going to sound like a mutual admiration society, which in a way it is, but voices like yours, you, you've been one of the singular courageous voices running against some of the tide here and against the current that you're describing. And I appreciate that so much from you. And there are others. I mean, there are people, Rachel Maddow. I mean, there, there are others out there talking about this. The problem I think is this. It's got two sides to it. One is that the appeal to fear and greed uh, to the amygdala <clears throat> part of the brain, part of the brain, the old reptilian brain stem, yeah, is easy. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it takes no heavy lifting. There's no heavy, you know, people don't have to think if they're fearful, and they won't. They don't have to think if they're greedy. And so you can appeal to fear and greed, and that's what Fox News does. They, they built their whole uh, business plan around the appeal to fear and to greed and to misinformation, but they packaged it very cleverly. They were very good at the narrative side of their business. These stories were interesting. Fox News apparently has a quite a, a good reputation for telling stories, even if they're false and phony and so forth, and sure. people up against yeah. the wrong things. Yeah. But that's the business plan. And that's why the, the uh, uh, 
uh, Murdoch family, you, you split. James uh, is is split off, and yeah, this is an interesting it. story. What's happened and, in that family? Because that family yeah. dominates the, the UK. My friends in Australia. I mean, it's not uh, uniquely American. Murdoch owns major, huge conglomerates of media in, I think, uh, every English speaking country. And there, there's there, there's money to be made. Oh, and yeah. So as long as you can make a lot of money by yep. stirring up fear and greed yep. and, and yep. Uh, selling BS, then, then they'll do it. And the second part of it is, is this. We have, in, in the First Amendment, the right from of freedom of speech. And I think it probably needs uh, an, a bit of an update. I wouldn't throw it out. That's not what I'm saying. But I think we need to consider how speech is used in this country. Uh, there was a case during the uh, 2016 election where a graduate of Davidson College in North Carolina, great college, but he graduated from Davidson and he created a little website and he was stirring up uh, all kinds of selling stories. Uh, one was had to do with uh, uh, he, somebody had found a warehouse in Columbus, Ohio, that was full of ballots already marked for Hillary Clinton or some such. And he made something like I don't remember the exact number, but it's not like $25,000, which is a lot of money, but people would advertise on that site. But he knew it was a lie. Now, I think there has to be some liability for deliberately telling lies. Mm. We, we'll, we'll worry about science accuracy later because there is room for lots of difference of opinion. But I, I think there has to be some penalty. Uh, who is this guy? Alex Jones. Yeah. Deliberately peddling misinformation. I mean, he, he knew it was bull and hurtful. Uh, misogynistic or the I mean that that asshole said kids didn't die at Sandy Hook and so yep. I mean that's the that's the best way to cut to the chase on him David Orr but I I, I mean it's funny that you're 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 saying that we have to in in some way regulate speech given the, this is what I'm interpreting the fact that especially social media uh, let it, it helps a lie travel so far so fast before the truth can even get its pants on. And today we're seeing actually Twitter and Facebook over the last month making some major, major moves. And, and, and today, as we speak, friends of mine uh, uh, just texting me that, that Twitter is uh, locking down the accounts even of the Trump campaign. I I may have this wrong. I'll look it up. And at, at the point of people hearing this, you'll know the news and his spokeswoman, Kaylee McEnany. But it's very interesting to see Facebook and Twitter. And it's also disconcerting and, 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 and causes concern, because if they can cut down on that speech, they can cut down on any someone might argue. But it is interesting to see them making these moves. It's accelerant for that right wing echo chamber, by the way, that we're talking about. And I, I I'm concerned there. Yeah. But is that what you mean? Suggestions like that from major social media titans to to say listen you can't just you can't just say these things they're very dangerous you know pete we've got one of our one of our episodes has got uh kevin roos from the new york times shoshana zuboff who's the author of a great book called surveillance capitalism and ben scott who's a young guy that started a website to think about and, and do something about the role of media in elections in american politics what I would propose, number one, is let's get some smart people around us that know media, know how it works, and let's talk through what the options are. I don't think we can toss babies out with bathwater. Uh, I'm not on Facebook or any social media myself, but uh, a lot of people are. And two you're, three actually, you are. Your, your TikTok account, though, is really popular, David Orr. I'm very <laughs> imp- da- I had no idea you had moves <laughs> like that. I see you. I see oh, your I TikTok account. Deep, deep secret. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you with that joke, but it was too too rich right there. I had to. Well, uh, let's keep that a secret. But you know, Peter, we need to. This needs to be thoughtfully done from a public perspective. If democracy is important, and I, I think it is, it's not a slam dunk case in a situation of emergency in a, a you know in a fire situation. Fire departments don't make decisions democratically. Right. Safely. Right. Good example. So. But in terms of selecting a government and organizing government purposes and so forth and deciding what the nation is and what we are as a people, democracy is really important. It's the only form of governance, as imperfectly as it is, that says you and I and all everybody within hearing distance, people have dignity. And we will protect mm-hmm. that as best we're able. Now, obviously, it doesn't do that well enough, but there's no other form of government that 
even makes an attempt to do people have dignity and what would be the line that you would add to about the rest of species people have dignity and nature has or the planet has how would you articulate well, that in democracy on change there's a, there's a chapter by mary woods that gets into this what are the rights of future generations and what are the rights of other species hmm. how do we you know we, we've gone from it was only white males in athens not slaves but white males that happen to have <laughs> you know, property or membership in a tribe or whatever, they, they could vote. And they were part of the- at the beginnings of democracy. We started with white males in Athens and we've gotten to, to what you, you come up to the American experience. And it took us a while to give Native Americans, long while to give Native Americans the right to vote and participate and African Americans and Asian Americans and so forth and women. And we've gradually extended the franchise. And can we continue that effort to extend what we, how we define we, we the people. What, do, what does that include? And can we uh, include also forms of life? Does nature have rights? There's a guy, a uh, lawyer, Chris Stone, that years ago wrote a book called Should Trees Have Standing? And the argument was, that, yeah, hmm. they, they should. They, they should be given some legal protection. And there's a movement to have rivers have standing. Hmm. There's a movement here in Ohio that uh, actually got slapped down by a court that to give Lake Erie this body of water rights there's some things you don't do to lakes uh, standing meaning a, the legal term for for rights similar to a human in case anybody's yeah, missed it. but that, yeah. that, that, that's what it means you're talking about in a court of, of law arguing that nature has rights it's fascinating i want yeah, to learn and, more about that if you think if you think of uh democracy as an intergenerational thing then how do you include democratically the rights of people unborn obviously they can't speak for themselves but in the case in legal, the courts do this all the time. They will assign guardians for people unable to speak for themselves. And so those guardians, effectively, as best they're able, speak for the interests of those people who cannot. We could do the same for future generations. We, we, the, the future generations want clean air. They want clean water. They, they want, there's some things we can say that they will want, for sure. But the, the same is true with nature. But the, odd, the weird part about this is, Pete, again, it's like the argument about efficiency and uh, solar power, it's the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. In this case, taking care of future generations and having a wider sense of that word we, it, it includes all of us and those unborn, and includes a respect for the natural world of what Albert Schweitzer called reverence for the na- for reverence for nature. It, it, it's weird because that also comes back to us as individuals as a benefit. People who and and I hold cultures who pay attention to the rights of the future out seven generations as the uh, Iroquois and Cherokees did and uh, taking care of natural systems actually do better because they don't make the mistakes that careless people and careless societies routinely make. Greedy people. So maybe. I think there's this irony in all this uh, that the that environment is uh, taking care of the environment, taking care of future generations in this strange way. Is ironic in that what appears to be an act of selfishness uh, or selflessness is an act that's also kind of selfish. It, it's in our interest. Here. Yeah. So that that word self-interest <clears throat> is a bigger word. Uh, a society that reflected on these things a little bit uh, would, would come to this pretty quickly. And it, it's the same thing. That it, it, if I say this differently, Pete, you you know this, and, and you said very eloquently the same thing in, in better words than I'm going to use. But I doubt you, you pay for, you, yeah. you pay for things whether you pay at the cash register or not. So if uh, you you pay for not having kids in poor neighborhoods go to good schools and have three square meals a day and their health care is covered, you, you're going to pay eventually, and it'll be paid in the currency of crime or lost lives or uh, you know, other kind of costs, the health care costs or whatever, but but you'll pay. The idea is somehow that we can't afford to do the right thing. No, 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 you, you can't afford not to do the right thing because the cost will sooner or later come back to bite you. Somehow we need, a, we need a bigger concept of the economy. And there are lots of people who have written about this. John Maynard Keynes for one long time ago, yeah. great British economist. Keynes was famous not for his mathematical formulas for, you know, whether it was uh, charging reparations to the Germans in World, after World War I or whatever, but he was most famous for asking so eloquently and profoundly, 
what's an economy for? And we have uh, somehow gotten a horse and a cart in the wrong relationship. We think the economy is supreme and we ought to do whatever it takes to make it grow. Instead of asking an economy should be subservient to us. The people yeah, having society. a moral clarity on economics. You've written so much about this yourself, and it's such an important and fascinating issue. You can put Keynes aside. There's so many great thinkers, including you and young folks, talking about this. You can't have a conversation about supply and demand, minimum wage, taxes, without having a moral clarity on what you think an economy is for. How did I do right there? That was brilliant. And, and you're, you're exactly right that there are a lot of people. Kate Rayworth's book on donut economics. Yes, she's great. Ago. Yeah, it's a brilliant book. Uh, she's a British economist yep. and has served in, in various positions around Europe and, and Britain. Uh, Herman Daly, way back when. I mean, Herman is the the founder of what's called the steady state economy movement, and it essentially it was asking if prices tell the truth about what we do in the world. And instead of imposing it, and this, <clears throat> this is going to get a little disjointed, but Pete, we knew back when Laurie Garrett wrote her book, uh, it was called The Coming Plague or something of that sort, back in the 1994-95. We knew way back when that there was going to be a plague. We didn't know the name of it. We didn't know it was going to be COVID-19, but we knew it was coming. And she and others warned us. Other epidemiologists uh, were saying the same thing. She just said it better and more profoundly in a best-selling, uh, very authoritative book, still in print. Yeah. But that that book, we should have set aside. Now, you've got, uh, I'm sure you've got uh, fire insurance and insurance against flood and lightning and wind and all that kind of stuff. You have to have insurance and own a house these days. Drive a car, yeah. Why don't we take insurance out on aspects of the economy? So if you want to move heavy things long distances like, uh, goods from China that go to Walmart and so forth, you're also going to move a lot of light things like viruses around. That's just built into the global economy. And sooner or later, you're going to have a pandemic. We knew that, but we didn't pay the cost. Now we're having to pay trillions of dollars to try to scramble around and, and keep the economy. Uh, pandemic insurance. Yeah, pandemic insurance. And the same is true with climate change. We know the climate change is going to hit us like a ton of bricks. So we ought to be taking out insurance or uh, reparations for our, our kids if we let it go too far. But we ought to be taking out insurance. Every householder has to do it on their, their home. Every car owner has to do it on their car. Uh, guarding against the small probability, but the certain probability, that sooner or later something bad is going to happen. But that that's... Uh, that's getting off on a, a different subject. No, but, but it's, a, it, so it, it's an in, it's it's a very interesting uh, policy solution <laughs> that no one probably hears about. So I'm glad that you did. Um, well, listen, let me let me let you go. I've taken over an hour of your time, but I would take ten more hours, and I would do this every week, and I would do this as much. I, I so enjoy listening to you and, and and reading you, and just trying to be able to continue to dance with you in a conversation, David or so. Uh, whenever your next availability is, I'd like to continue it and, and continue promoting the state of American democracy dot org, the book and the video series. And put me in touch with anybody you want to in terms of, by the way, of your PR people to to help do that if there's any kind of uh, media campaigns. Hey, I'll, I'll do that. And Pete, thanks so much for what you're doing. You're a voice for sanity and I appreciate you so much. Thanks for having me on the program. Love talking to you. Thank you so much, David. Hey, hey, Pete, thanks. Same to you. All right, there goes David Orr, Dr. David Orr at Oberlin College. I highly recommend his book of essays, Hope is an Imperative. I've read it a lot. I really like it. You don't see him on CNN or MSNBC or going viral on social media, but he's one of these guys who's been brilliant and articulate for a very long time, doing work, affecting policy, and crafting young minds. I love that guy. Absolutely check out Democracy Unchained, How to Rebuild Government for the People, and that's the book on YouTube, the Democracy Unchained conversation series, and as I mentioned, all of David Orr's books as well. So great. All of those links are in the show notes to today's episode. All right, now on to my second guest, something very different. I know our next guest, my next guest joining me now for a long time. We met in stand-up comedy circles in New York City. She, along with my friend Dean Obidala, join, jointly produced the Arab American Comedy Festival, which I performed at several times. She was a regular on my radio show, and she has a TED Talk that's been seen 
by over 11 million views at this point. She's a comedian, she's an actress, a disability advocate, and a good friend of mine who I've known a really long time. Great on Twitter, at Zoon. So passionate, so brilliant, so hilarious. Here is just a, a part of the opening from her TED Talk. My name is Maysoon Zayed, and I am not drunk, but the doctor who delivered me was. He cut my mom six different times in six different directions, suffocating poor little me in the process. As a result, I have cerebral palsy, which means I shake all the time. Look. It's exhausting. I'm like Shakira Shakira meets Muhammad Ali. (laughs) CP is not genetic. It's not a birth defect. You can't catch it. No one put a curse on my mother's uterus. And I didn't get it because my parents are first cousins, which they are. (laughs) It only happens from accidents, like what happened to me on my birthday. Now, I must warn you, I'm not inspirational. (laughs) I don't want anyone in this room to feel bad for me. Because at some point in your life, you have dreamt of being disabled. (laughs) Come on a journey with me. It's Christmas Eve. You're at the mall. You're driving around in circles looking for parking. (laughs) And what do you see? 16 empty handicap spaces. (laughs) And you're like, God, can't I just be a little disabled? So, my friends, now my conversation, this was a couple of weeks ago now with Maysoon Zayed. Allah on the national stage. Did any Muslim get a uh, spot at the convention? No. So everything's better now. And we're super included (laughs) in the campaign. And I'm going to be in an ad on Friday. But they messed up and had no Muslims. And I actually like made fun of everyone. I wrote them. I was like, you didn't have to have like radical Miss Palestinian equality. You could have had Hassan Minhaj. He killed it at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. One minute, you get your Muslim yeah. quota, and you're done. Um, let's just uh, talk a little bit about you um, for okay. those people who those you know. I guess maybe there's somebody out there that isn't part of the 11 <laughs> million people who've watched your TED Talk, which I just rewatched. Actually, it's so so good. I highly recommend Thank it. You. And um, you uh, refer yourself as disabled and a member of the disabled community. But I is do. That, like, is, is there any is there any uh, debate about the words that we use to Very, describe? I th- I almost thought disabled was no longer favored. Yeah. So is there, is there a thing? Is there a conversation? There's a that? thing. There's like a whole conversation about that, and it's basically parents and educators versus actual disabled adults. So the majority of people with disabilities are not a monolith, right? Like 46 of us, 46% of us voted against our interest last election and picked Trump. So we're not a monolith, but 46% of people who identify as disabled voted for Trump. Do you want to know why it's really? Sick yeah, I do. And then I'll why. get back to the language because, because he's disabled also. They thought there was solidarity. Be, that would be good if it was like represent like Tammy Duckworth. No, um, it's because white disabled people, not all of them, not all white people, but white disabled people feel like they don't get the things that they need because brown people are getting it illegally and black people are faking their disability. <laughs> So they don't realize that the reason they're not getting access to health care, to education, to food is because the GOP refuses to expand Obamacare because SNAP is being cut by Trump because Medicare and Medicaid are a sham. They think it's because black people are faking it. Brown people are stealing it. And the good white disabled people are suffering. Oh, by the way, the Good White Disabled People uh, is a great organization that meets <laughs> Mondays at the Knights of Columbus in I Utica. Mean, the head of it is that 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 dude Madison that stood up for the national anthem. Like, it was, oh yeah, yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. The whole big deal, and this he's running thing. against my friend Mo, Mo Davis down in North Carolina. Yeah. Okay, well, tell Mo Davis Madison didn't do it first. 
Tammy Duckworth was at the Democratic National Convention. I bet he knows that. Yeah. Standing next to her wheelchair. And nobody clapped for that. But that's we should, guys should connect you with him so you can be disabled people from Mount Davis. <laughs> yes. Um, getting yeah. back to my question about yeah, you so said it's, it's parents and educators that generally don't like the word disabled. It's this quote uh, disabled adults that still use yeah, it. Dig it. Is that what you said? The, okay. Yeah. And I'm going to explain why super quick. Special needs is what educators like. Our needs are not special. They're just human needs. We feel like calling them special needs euphemizes it. And we're not children and we don't want to be called special needs. The reason that we're not people with disabilities, I'm going to use my cerebral palsy as an example. So for your audience, if they can't see me, I have cerebral palsy. I shake all the time. It's pretty sexy. Neither here nor there. So I'm not with my cerebral palsy. It's not my date to the prom. So like people with a disability, you don't call people, people with black, people with Latino. Our identifier is disabled. And the idea is this. Number one, a lot of people are freaked out and fear disability. We're the one group that you can join at any time. Like we do not discriminate. People fear disability. If we use the moniker that we are labeled with by everybody who's not being nice and saying people with disabilities to our face, they're like that crip, that gimp, that limping chick, that whatever. If we own disability, we destigmatize it and we create it as an identity that's just part of who we are, but doesn't define completely who we are. When you say we're with disabilities, it implies that we could leave them. We cannot leave them. They follow us and chase us everywhere. So that's why disabled people, it's just shorter. Like spell it out on your phone. A lot of us are gimpy. We don't have time to type out people with disabilities. So what are, yeah, what are the other uh, phrases that might be preferred? Uh, well, and, and how big of an issue is this? I love the way you okay. just explained it. But within your community, is there a fight over the way that you should be referred? And then I, I, I want to break down the community a little bit too. Yeah. So our hashtag online is disco. Get it? Disabled community. Disco. Oh, okay. All right. So we're cool. disco, which I think is cool and cute. Didn't know that. Uh, we have a big fight with journalists. Like I wrote a piece and my editor, I wrote a piece about person first language versus identity first language. And the editor corrected every time I said disabled person or disabled people to people with disabilities every time. And the article was about how it should be disabled people. Oh, that's so journalists, even when they're quoting you, switch it up for us. And it's really like we just can't break through and get journalists to respect that like adults, academics in disability all use disabled people. We can't get them to do it. Is there much of a discussion or, or a debate amongst the adult disabled community about the word? Is it, I mean, you're, 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 you're making it sound like you guys it's a pretty 20, much agree. It's a 2080. There's a generation that were convinced that putting the word disabled first strips them of their humanity and they want their humanity being a person first. So that's what I mean by it's not a monolith. But like when you ask them, they're like, I was taught this. I was told this right. and it's hard to kind of take that away. Yeah. And then of course, you know, a huge part of our community passes and they don't like come out as disabled because not all disabilities are visible like mine. And the stigma against invisible disabilities is just like so strong. Your disability is cerebral palsy. What is that? And how much does it differ from one person to another? It, it differs a lot. Although, so, also, by the way, when I asked that question, I told you what you're just, dis- I don't know if you heard that. Your disability <laughs> yeah, is cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy. Thank right. you. For, thank you for telling me. We like to call it CP and my fe- fellow palsy people are called seeps like peeps, but palsy. So um, <laughs> my cerebral palsy, I was born on Labor Day and my doctor was like doing shots at DJs and I lost four minutes of oxygen because he was drunk. And now I look like I'm drunk all the time. Um, It's a neurological disorder. I love to tell people like my brain is damaged. So what cerebral palsy is, is a TBI, a traumatic brain injury that only happens in a certain window of time in utero, during delivery, or within the first couple of months of life. After that point, when you get this brain injury, it's called a TBI instead of cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy 
sends messages from your brain to your muscles in all the wrong directions. So some people with cerebral palsy are nonverbal because it's hard to control their tongues and enunciate. Some of us are wheelchair users. And in my case, mine is I shake all the time. So it's manifested really by the fact that I'm just constantly shooting messages to all the wrong places. And like, you know, I can dance, I can walk, but I can't stand. So I'm a sit down, stand up comic. I've always sat on a stool on stage because I can't stand. I fall over like a weeble wobble. It's a permanent disability. It is super painful because if you think about like shaking, like just doing that for like 24 hours, my joints and muscles hurt all the time. It's like super painful. Um, I'm very holistic. You know, I dig your wife and I always talk about her. I do yoga. I, you know, I don't eat meat. I avoid chemicals and dyes and all that stuff. Some people use medication. Some people don't. There's no shame in medicating. I choose not to. And uh, yeah, that's my CP. Uh, and up until 1993, I couldn't be covered by health insurance because I was born with a pre-existing condition. And then the Clinton administration did something that made it so that people like me could be insured. Wow. And that's one of the biggest fears right now is that like if we get stripped of health care, what happens? Yeah. Um, what about lifespan for people with cerebral palsy? Is there a, a range or is it normal average? So about 40, 50 years ago, it was 26 to 30. And a wow. lot of that. Yeah. And a lot of that came from the fact that, unfortunately, a lot of people with disabilities get institutionalized. And when you're institutionalized, there's a lack of care and your body ages and breaks down more quickly. However, if you're a person with cerebral palsy in a situation where you're well taken care of, your life expectancy is the same as any other person in the country you reside in. That's an important point. Um, let's talk about the country you reside in. Were you, <laughs> were you born in, the, in, in New Jersey? Were you born in the U.S.? Yeah, I yeah, just, the doctor was taking shots at the Jersey Shore. He didn't hop on a plane to Jerusalem right. to deliver me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm born in Jersey. And, you know, I'm one of the people that cult 45 ch chance sent her back about, you know, right. me uh, and she, the Shiloh Deer are like twins. To, to who, is, who, who is like twins? What did you say? Congresswoman Rashida Khalidi. Oh, right. Both born in America, Palestinian brown girls, really good hair. Uh, what, what about your lineage? Tell me about your family. When, it, when and why did they come here? So my mother was born an American citizen. My grandfather came here in 1936. So even though she was born in a little village outside of Ramallah in Palestine, she was born American. My dad was like the classic... Poor boy, born on a farm in Palestine, who dreamt of going to America and took like the most epic securitous route that your listeners can read about or listen to in my best selling memoir, Find Another Dream. So he hopped on a plane to visit his brother in Colombia, and then they literally walked into America. And it took a very long time. And then they got into America and they were like ballers and like super good looking guys. So they found two hotties to marry and they became American citizens. And according to my dad, his hottie was the meanest woman he had ever met in his life. How so? She was so like him and my uncle met these girls. They got married. They basically were, you know, getting citizenship. And my uncle's hottie was like super nice. And she like kind of loved him and wanted it all to work out. And my dad's hottie was like checking days off the walls like it was prison, just getting ready wow. to get divorced. So then my dad got divorced and he built his empire. And eight years after he got here, he flew back to Palestine to marry the girl of his dreams. My mother, he brought her to America in 1966. She was 19. She had four kids by the age of 26. And then she started college and went on to become the chief of lab of Jersey City Medical Center. And my dad took on the girl dad duties. So while my mother was studying, he was a traveling salesman who adjusted his schedule to take care of me 24 seven. So I basically hung out with my dad until I was 16. <laughs> yeah. And your dad's no longer with us, but you guys are really no. close. You speak about yeah. him with a lot of reverence, right? You know, I think about like, what's the image of the average American of an Arab Muslim dad? Hmm. They think of like someone oppressive, 
they think of something like honor killings. And meanwhile, like you've heard the stories of my dad, funniest dude you'd ever meet. Super cool. If he saw like a bird injured in the street, he would like weep and heal it. He was just a really good guy. Who Did created- he do that simply to convert the bird? Yes, <laughs> that's all we ever do anything for. Me and Dean and Aaron Cater one time gave out toasters in exchange for people saying, and we basically converted them for toasters. So it's something we would do. <laughs> no, but like, I got to tell you something really sad. Like in the United States of America, we have a day of mourning for people with disabilities who are killed by their parents. When kids with disabilities are killed by their parents, journalists covering the stories often sympathize with the parent. They'll say something like she was at the end of her rope. She had no support. It was a mercy killing. The father was dying. He didn't know who would take care of the kid. There's no other filicide, no other murder of children that we excuse except for when it's disabled. So like, I didn't know my father. I knew my father was a hero and like, the one person I wanted to hang out with all the time, but I didn't know how lucky I was. And that like so many disabled people who reach out to me have parents who frame them as burdens, have parents who steal their benefits. If they have benefits, don't let them get married because they don't want to lose the access, you know, to that money physically and emotionally abuse them. So I think the fact that my father was so positive and so inclusive and worked so hard on making sure I was independent is what, you know, um, makes him really extraordinary. And I think that the abuse that we see of the disabled community is really amplified by this administration and the way disabled people have been treated throughout the COVID pandemic. We are disposable. Anytime they talk about those numbers, oh, it's just those damn disabled people. They, their lives suck anyway. They're better off dead. You are, you know, you have cerebral palsy. I did it again. And you're, yeah. so you're a member of a community of people. And cerebral palsy, of course, as you mentioned, is, can be on a spectrum. Uh, it affects people, everybody differently. Um, but who, who do you find yourself relating to uh, in solidarity with in, in the disabled community? Is it... Is it everybody? Is it people with injury? Yeah. No, it's everybody. It's everybody. And like, I don't know what the experience of, say, Ali Stroker, my really good friend who uh, won the Tony. She's so cool. I don't know what the experience is of navigating life in a wheelchair. I can get in and out of comedy clubs that other people can't. Right. But the solidarity within our community is that the obstacles that we face, we face regardless of what the disability is. But there's an intersection, right? So like black. There's got to be many. Yeah. Yeah. Black, black disabled women. Okay, so 50 percent of all Americans killed by law enforcement are disabled. Right. But really 50, 50 percent, 50 percent. This is why kind of statistics is that I've never heard that. I mean, I'm I'm not challenging that. I just don't understand that. I'm going to say. I'm going to send you the links from BBC and NBC. Two of my friends did the research on it and it's, it's devastating, but like, just let's think about me. For example, Pete, I do a joke about this, about how anytime I get pulled over, I look like I'm drunk, right? Here's the thing. If I'm told, cause you know how my body moves, you've seen me. If I'm told not to move, no sudden movements, put your hands at 10 and two, I can't physically comply there's nothing I can do to not make a sudden movement. Um, a lot of people who are autistic, if you're screaming at them commands, they cannot comply. Yeah, there are this people I've heard who a lot are about, deaf. Yeah. There are people who have mental health episodes and 911 is called for help. And those people end up dead. So there's also there's also disproportionate amount of violence towards disabled students from like cops and enforcement in school. And there's a disability of prison pipeline. So like it's all tied, you know, together. So when the disability community comes together, we respect the fact that like disabled black women are at a bigger risk than like the lost Kardashian disabled woman that I am, even in society, (laughs) even in a society that hates Muslims, I'm not visibly Muslim. You know what I mean? But my black disabled friends 
are visibly black and disabled and there's nothing they can do. And so the community works together. The only people that we shun are the Trump supporters. Because I just can't hang out with people who are okay with our community dying in big numbers. Um, let me let me um, take a few steps back. I'm looking at an article right now that is um, telling me exactly what you said to I me. Mean, I've heard about people with with you know mental disabilities, especially autism, being shot and killed by police officers. And this is also a really important conversation to have about when you hear the idea of defunding the police. I've never thought that's a good. Uh, that that's that that's an effective messaging. But it, but if you take it, you know, turn the page, it makes a tremendous amount of sense because we're trying to talk about help helping actually law yeah. enforcement by helping them not have to respond or give them, you know, training or have other people respond that can understand. In this case, we're talking about disabled people. But let me just ask you about it's the worst branding ever. Yeah, I, I, I don't look, disagree. Look, but, look, 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 forget. Oh, there's your cat. Oh, you. Oh, this I is Beyonce. It. Hi, but you named your cat Beyonce. I did. If oh. I had had a daughter, I would have named her Beyonce. I didn't. Do you so love I Beyonce? I love, love. I feel like there's a person Beyonce. who's got everything to lose. That woman is <laughs> revered in a way. <laughs> no, you know, so few others are like if she makes one tiny mistake, God forbid. No, but there's one person I love more than Beyonce. Who? Do- Dolly Parton. What? Dolly Parton is the that most must be personal. Revered, you, that, that the most be. revered woman in all of society globally is Dolly Parton. What? That, I mean, that's your opinion. That can't. She's, well, she's the greatest entertainer. She's donated millions and millions of dollars quietly to improve and change the entire effing world. She's hmm. got, you know, I identify with her chest wise. I just, I love Dolly. You're a large breasted woman. We are. Yeah, we are. Um, no, I was going to ask you about uh, <laughs> government. And, okay, and, much and, more fun than large-breasted women. Let's talk about government. Well, we can tie it in somehow. <laughs> um, well, I just think that if you are a person with a disability, then you or become... Or a disabled person. Oh, uh, forgive me, I just, yeah. <laughs> or a disabled person. Um, you are, you, you have to, you, to be dependent on government not necessarily only for different types of financial uh, in solutions, and benefits, but but simply things like ramps and entrances and parking spots like that. That isn't something local, state and, and, and national governments, not only in our country, but other countries have to make accommodations and create the resources and pathways for disabled people. So you, you must have. All disabled people must have a kind of a, a different and hopefully better and less ignorant understanding of the relationship they have with government. And I don't want to use the word dependence, but I don't know another word. I mean, if oh. government is not going to build uh, and, and, and insist that or make a law that ramps are built and doorways and, and, and all the accommodations that you need for your everyday life, then it's not going to be done by the private sector because it costs money. So talk to me about the relationship between disabled people and government and what that relationship generally is. So generally. this is this is fun because like this is my message box and my sound bite like all wrapped into one. OK, so not all disabled people are dependent on the government and it is very, very, very difficult to get any sort of financial assistance from the government. The way assistance systems are set up, like Social Security, Disability, SNAP, force disabled people to stay in poverty because if they make more than a certain amount of money, like I do, alhamdulillah, you know, like I'm a soap star, I'm a comic, I, I've, I've got bucks, I don't get a dime, not one penny from the United States government. I pay astronomical fees for my private insurance because I'm not eligible for any like breaks for Obamacare. My physical therapy is not covered by my insurance because you have to show improvement and my disability is permanent. So I can't improve. I have to have a personal care assistant. I can't wash my own hair. I can't cut my own nails. None of those things are deductible. The only medical expenses that they let disabled people deduct are actual invasive procedures. So I can't deduct my physical therapy. I can't deduct my personal care. It is very, very expensive being a disabled person in America. 
So if you're someone like my friends who need 24 hour assistance because say they're paraplegic and they need someone to help them with washing, eating and sleeping, if they get a great job like mine, they're never going to make enough money to take care of themselves. So they have to make a decision between pursuing their dreams and staying alive. It's like super disturbing. And it's a game with the government in that we have permanent disabilities and we have to prove it every six months. So like for me with my disabled parking, every year I have to go to the DMV with a letter from my doctor saying that my permanent disability is still permanent. And it's the same thing for people on social security disability. Every six months, they have to prove it. And the process of proving that they're eligible is expensive, it's tiring, and a lot of us lack something called executive function. I was seven minutes late coming to you today because I can't tell time. There's a lot of us that like can write epic novels but can't deal with a checkbook. There's parts of our brains that can't deal with executive function. And having to constantly jump through hoops to get your benefits is all about power and executive function. So who's getting access to to education? Rich, disabled kids. Who's getting the best health care and having the best health outcomes? Rich, disabled kids that can get the physical therapies, that can get the -the state-of-the-art wheelchairs. There is a law. It's called the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was signed 30 years ago. The Trump administration is trying to roll it back. Really? Yes. Well, Republicans always do, don't they? Always. The ADA. Always. Yeah, but it was I, I signed asked. by a Republican president. It was George Herbert Walker Bush that signed it. But here's the thing about the ADA. It is 100% not enforceable. So people think like if I go to a club and there's no elevator, I can call the ADA and report it. That's not how it works. Hmm. You complain. They have six months to fix it. Then you have to follow up and complain again if they didn't. There's nothing to enforce it. It's like this is the law. We really want you to do it. But like they just built a like $27 million museum in Queens and it wasn't fucking accessible. It was all stairs, like the whole architecture of it was stairs and they got sued and they had to redesign. But there's nothing to force us to comply with the ADA except disabled people policing the people who are violating it and then being told we're destroying small businesses. <laughs> um, the American Disabilities Act became law in 1990. It's a, the ADA is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, all public and private places that are open to the general public. In 2008, the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendments Act, the ADAAA, was signed into law and became effective January 2009. So that was uh, during That's Obama. What was that? What what did what, if anything, did that do the amendment to it? Do you know that? I don't know. Well, um, but I have what is what is it recommend for people who want to learn about the ADA? There's an amazing movie on Netflix called Crip Camp. My friend Jim Lebrecht and Nicole Newman made it. It's called Crip Camp. And it's all about a camp in New York where a bunch of disabled people went. And they were the people who made the ADA happen. What 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 is the resistance to uh, um, the ADA or is is it it's about this is going to cost me cost money me to have money. to like what's an example of that and and why doesn't government make it easier for you know small businesses to not have to right spend money uh, um, that they don't, they might not have to help people with disabilities. And I would imagine it gets some kind of slippery slope where a business owner is like, yeah, I built a ramp for people in a wheelchair, but now you're asking me to do this for people with CP. You're asking me to do this for, I mean, like, I, 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 I don't can, even, I can fix it all for you. Okay. So it's, <laughs> I, the, alone. The, I alone can fix that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the very best is yet to come. Oh my God. That's, Mayuna just going my, through all of her best. <laughs> I'm just my, my impressions, impressions of Trump um, and universal design. So the two things that you hear all the time, it costs too much and it's not aesthetically pleasing. 
the things that we want to do cost too much and they're not aesthetically pleasing. So like I was at a university that had a gravel path, the disabled students were begging for some pavement and they were like, it ruins the aesthetics. So here's the solution. Universal design means that it's accessible to everyone, knowing that nothing is ever accessible to everyone. So if you go in building something from the ground up thinking, I'm going to make this accessible to the blind, the deaf, and people with mobility um, disabilities, you make that place easier for everybody else. So like women with strollers, old people, people dragging luggage, people who sprain their ankle, when you, skateboarders, mm -hmm. when you buy, when you, when you build it in, it's cheaper and it increases the accessibility to 20% of the population, right? Because people with disabilities are 20% of the population and we're actually like 25 but I'm not talking about stuff like lupus and chronic pain, where there's very little that you can do to, hmm. to accommodate something like that. But we're 20% of the population. We have $8 trillion in buying power. So when you make stuff accessible for disabled people, it's good business. But nobody has ever sat there and laid it out for them. And so they think of it as like undue burden. In education, it's super annoying because when we try to make education accessible, the excuse is always it's an unfair advantage. We just can't seem to get professors to understand that like giving notes to someone who can't take notes is not an unfair advantage. It's leveling the playing field. So whether it's physical or whether it's structural, no one wants to do it. But COVID kind of changed that, right? Because oh. a lot of the shit that disabled people were fighting for, remote learning, working from home when your chronic pain flares up and you can't sit in an uh, office, yeah, yeah. adjusted work hours where you're working at certain times of day and it doesn't have to be a nine to five. We now have access to all of that stuff that we were told was unrealistic, would affect the workspace negatively. You can't learn that way. Unfair advantage. Now it's mainstream. And it's economical for a lot of people. So we're hoping that if we ever make it out of COVID, which will only happen if Donald Trump, you know, is dragged out of the White House by his pillow. Um, that's the we hope that people will keep these accessibilities in place once we once we don't need them. How do you want him dragged out by what? His pillow, his hair. His, I want him. I want hello. Is that Arabic for hair? This is Spanish for hair. I thought so. I was like, oh, it's Arabic. But it sounds like pillow. Um, I want him dragged out by his hair, but I want like the old school twist the hair around your fist and drag. <laughs> that stops, I don't think that's going to work. I mean, that it's just stops come it out. from ripping. That's what stops Ugh. it from ripping. He's got one long strand wrapped around his entire head. How did you wrap that around? Yeah, no. I, no I think you're right about that. I think it's absolutely right. How did you feel when the, his former or deputy campaign manager was beat up by the police, Brad Pascal? How did you, how did you feel? Did you see that video? I did. How did you feel when you saw that video, knowing who that guy is and, and what he's been responsible for? I, I felt Brianna Taylor. I felt like, why is this guy able to do all he's doing without getting shot down in a blaze of glory? Mm -hmm. I felt like, Oh, look, here we go again. Another Trump high ranking official who yeah. beats women because how many allegedly have we heard? Well, yeah, allegedly. Um, let me ask you about the other uh, real knock. Have they fired him yet? Because I know he was demoted. But after that, they tried to make us all feel guilty. And that turned out to be a whole different situation. Yeah. Like, yeah, does he yeah still but, work for them. Uh, I don't know. Probably. Probably give him a raise. Once they found out he abused a woman, they're probably like, oh, wow. allegedly. But he definitely got yeah. his knees kicked out. That was kind of fun for a second. I see. I didn't like it because I want to be consistent and I don't I, I don't use the word hate much, but I hate that guy, Brad Parscale. But I actually thought the police were way, way overkill the like, dude is wearing shorts I thought they were underkill yeah I he swear. was wearing he had, he had no he had he was wearing shorts he had no shoes no, no shirt. shirt he was completely calm in that moment 
And it doesn't matter what somebody did an hour ago or a year ago or a month ago, whatever horrible crimes they might have committed in that moment. They could. They could I'm all about de-escalating situations. Even See, I often. think this is very telling because I think I've been trained to be like, well, they usually kill people. So they did nothing to him. So that, that, I feel like that's the wrong way to look at it. No, I agree with you, but yeah. that's how I've been trained to think. Yeah, no, I understand that. I think we all have been um, conditioned to, to think that way. Let me ask you about your uh, religious identity. You're always, at least you were, very religious. I'm a devout Muslim. Devout, whatever yes. that means. Devout means I believe in it. I practice it. I have a rational mind. So I'm not dogmatic about it. I challenge and question everything, but I, I believe in the faith. Have you, I, I pray, I practice. I don't push my beliefs on anyone else, but post 9-11, I made it my goal to be, you know, a Quranic expert and study the Quran and know how to respond, right. how to respond mm -hmm. to people. And the crux of Islam is that when you read the Quran, the message is tailored to each person who reads it. So you and I could read the exact same sentence and understand it and interpret it. It's all religion. Yeah. But I mean, when That's, you talk to dogmatic people, yeah. they insist this means this. Right. Especially in Islam. Right. They have a whole thing called the Hadith, which is a bunch of douche dudes explaining what the Quran means to us instead of having us read it. And because so many people are illiterate, these people dictate what the religion is. So when people think of Islam, I think they think of Saudi. And I can't think of a shittier example of a oh, Muslim than MBS. That would, that's actually an interesting thought experiment to, th to, to ask anybody, anybody, whether they're very enlightened and woke or completely ignorant, and naive about Islam, what, what they think of when they hear that, when they hear the word Islam or, or, or Muslim. They, they picture but, a Sikh. Yeah. But they literally picture a Sikh. It's the first thing they picture is a Sikh man. <laughs> it's a, a wrong, sick, sick, man. sick. Yeah. a completely right. different uh, religion. But that's like they've done. They've yeah. done like studies. And the very first thing they picture is a man with a beard mm. and a turban. Were you were, was your were your parents very religious? My mom is a is is a medical professional, so she's not very religious. My dad was super duper religious. Mm. Did that create conflict for them? Well, they got divorced when we were 16, when I was 16, but not because of religion. No, it didn't create conflict because even though my mother was more of a scientific mind, she didn't like make choices that conflicted with our faith. So it wasn't like one was a drinker, one wasn't, one was. And like, we've always all dressed the way that we do because the Quran just says cover. And for me, that means covering my bits for other people. That means nothing shows, you know, so... Right. We were conservative, but we didn't, you know, ha like I didn't have to wear a hijab. I, I worked at clubs. I traveled all over the world by myself. There's an enormous amount of trust. Yeah, I always, you know, I guess if I were to say what I think about Islam, I, I would think, and I say this certainly about Catholicism and, and, and Judaism to some extent, but usually um, probably in their more conservative interpretations i always I, I feel the problem with with all religion is that it makes women second class citizens and i think that that's the case of course in, in a, a lot of muslims and how they practice their religion what do you think about say the hijab or the idea that you have to follow well, i think it's a patriarchal interpretation of the faith right because the quran itself literally just says cover it doesn't say women should cover their hair hmm. it says human beings should cover that means both men and women and what that interpretation is i'll give you there's one thing in islam that bangs me up as far as women let me tell you about the other thing everyone thinks muslim men can have four wives no muslim men cannot have four wives they've read one sentence in the quran and they didn't read the next one it says that they can have four wives if they can treat them all equally and no human being can treat any other human being equally. It's my, my, impossible. My, bro my brother's done a pretty good job. But the one thing that is bad is we inherit half of what the men do. 
So that's one I can't make an excuse for. And when I die, I'll go to God and be like, what the fuck was that? And the way that I try to try to justify it is there's no way that the Quran hasn't been adulterated. There's no way that someone didn't change certain phrases and certain words from when it was dictated. So I blame women getting half the inheritance on some douche that changed it. Well, I mean, wasn't you don't you obviously don't believe that the Quran or any religious text was uh, created by men for men. I believe that the versions we read now are created by men for men. Hmm. How? So let's talk politics then. Yes. Um, and let's, what, what is another good question to ask you about your religion? I mean, no, I think about, we've rode that horse. Or Pegasus. It's a what? Pegasus. Muhammad what? rode a Pegasus from Medina to Jerusalem. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Are you laughing at my face? Absolutely. Are you treating me like oh, Amy Coney Barrett? Is yes. That, are you? Yes. If you believe that there was a horse that flew your guy, your prophet around with wings, I am laughing at you. I don't know what that says uh, about me. Donald Trump is your president. It's much more believable that Muhammad rode a Pegasus than 60 million people voted I for that. Totally, I totally disagree with that. This country, has, <laughs> this country has millions and millions of dumb, <laughs> ignorant, racist, stupid people that I mean, we and 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 this country has done a lot of sh- this. I was thinking about yesterday. Uh, you know, it's it's obvious you have to have a thoughtful conversation about American history and anybody can view it the way they want. Just the way that we view, you know, view religion, the good parts, the bad parts. But this country has done horrible things to its own people and to so many other people, including interfering in elections all over the world. So to some extent, I, I, I think we deserve uh-huh. Donald yeah. Trump. Yeah, I do. I yeah. think the certain because of a lot of what we've done over time, it adds up and we deserve him to some it's extent. It's kind of incredible. Like the America has America has done such bad shit in the Middle East, like Iraq and the lies and Gaza just constantly being bombed to the ground using American, you know, weapons and permission. But the Arab people that I talk to, they're like, yo, you guys deserve this. And we feel so bad for you. Like it's a combination of like, they know we deserve it, but they feel bad for us. Yeah. It's like after nine 11, like it was, it wasn't that people thought that we deserved that did all these people, you know, lost their lives in that, in that one moment, really. But they but, were like, but, now you know how it feels. Well, it was, it was, you could understand, you, you knew why the attack occurred because of what bin Laden said, you know, it was our interference in the middle East, in those countries that they, you know, if you take the emotion out of it, which is always hard for me, and you look at foreign policy, you, this is what happens. Well, this Bin Laden happens. was trained by the CIA, but I guess if you're a terrorist for the U.S., then it's OK. As yeah, but again, <laughs> you see, the CIA has seeded so many things that have come back yeah. to bite us. They've also done, I think you could argue, a lot of, you know, important things for American national security, but it's. And I mean, like, to be clear, as someone who lived in Jersey and I know you were in New York, like there was never any justification for 9-11. It's completely, completely unforgivable. We never deserve that. We kind of deserve Donald Trump because of what we've done. But, to the rest. Yeah, of- but the difference is I, I think the difference is and I'll, I may get in trouble if people don't listen closely to me. It's not that it was justified 9-11, the terrorist attack or that any terrorist attack is justified. But you understand why people feel the way they feel. You know what was not justified, though, and what was way worse, way worse than 9-11 was the invasion of Iraq. It was far worse. And there was no justification for it. And millions of people's uh, lives have been destroyed permanently because of that. And I think that it's very continue to be and continue continue to be. be. And I I think that the the war in Iraq is our generation's you know, uh, of Americans worst thing and, and very easy to forget about. Very easy to forget. And about. It was very, very hard for me to see Colin Powell on the Democratic convention stage, knowing that he was complicit, the damage that he did. To but the it, entire part I feel like not that I'm excusing him, but I feel like he's at least looked back on it and, and admitted it's a mistake. And I have less uh, sympathy for any of the architects of that war who haven't, many of which now are against Trump, including and are being like, spit shined, yeah. right? Bill Crystal and yeah. Um, so we got to wrap up. It's been an hour. No one listens to you for more than an hour. Oh, they hell yeah, they do. Are you kidding me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I gotta go. I have stuff. 
Oh, <laughs> there you go. Um, do you have one more minute or no? I have seven right more minutes. Okay. I was late. Uh, okay. So let me just ask you then about, you know, how, how you see what has happened in our country politically and, and, and where you stand politically as based on everything we just learned about you. Well, you know, full disclosure, I'm part of the Biden Disability Coalition. So I'm actually actively working with the campaign to try and, you know, beat Trump and end this nightmare. Um, I don't think we're going to win. I think we have zero chance of winning. I think really? You think that Trump yeah. will be elected? Really? Why do you think yeah. That? Teflon Don. He always wins. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, God rest her soul. May her name be a blessing. She just needed to hang on for 60 more days. Yeah. And because he's the luckiest fucker around, she died. And he appointed a third of the court. Well, if it's we a free and fair, cannot beat him. If Even a, in a free and fair election, you think more our people yeah. are going to be sitting watching the new season of Stranger Things. They're mm. not going to get up. They're not going to go vote. They're not going to check their voter registration. They're not going to know that they were purged. They're not going to know that their polling station was closed. They're not going to put on a fucking YouTube video and learn how to fill out a ballot correctly so that they're. Uh, vote is counted. And you know what? Prove me wrong. Prove well, me if you, wrong. If you really truly Beat believe him. that, why are you working with the Biden campaign? Because I have to fight to my last breath to beat Donald Trump, because if we don't, we will never vote again. I believe that five million so Palestinians you, will be wiped off the face of the earth and that any Palestinian territories would be gifted to Ivanka. I believe that Muslim Americans have a very good chance of being thrown in internment camps if they cannot afford to get out of here. So I have to fight to my last breath to beat him. But I have no faith in my fellow Americans putting our lives first right. and beating him. I just don't have the faith. I have faith in Kamala Harris and in Joe Biden. I think they're a great ticket. I want it to be Warren Harris, but I understand this is a misogynistic hellhole and we could only beat a white man with a white man. But I don't believe Americans will come through. I don't think we'll rise to the occasion. I think we're everything people ever said about us. I think you're wrong. I hope you're wrong. And um we will see, obviously. I'm, but, I'm, the, I'm the parent that's like, prove me wrong. No, it's fine. Prove I mean, me I, wrong, I'll buy you a car. Uh, well, <laughs> Tesla, please. May Zoom Zaid, everybody. I really, it's so great to catch up with you. Thank you this so much for so joining much me. so fun. Thank Do you. Do it again I get soon. the plug stuff? Uh, I'll plug them in the show notes, but plug it on online now. Okay, so maysoon.com, where they can watch every clip ever made of me. My book is called Find Another Dream. And... It's Audible. And yeah, audible.com backslash Maysoon. Nope. Awesome. Follow me on my social media. Maysoon, everybody. It's great to see you virtually. I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you. I do too. Take care of yourself. Take care of that dog's leg. Oh my God. <laughs> Maysoon. Yeah, that was, that, was, that was a problem. The dog fell. I held on to an interview for too long. Should have put it out there weeks ago when I did it two weeks ago because... She's so great. Love talking to her and catching up with her. Thank you to Maysoon Zayed as well as Dr. David Orr. And thank you to everybody supporting this podcast with a paid subscription. If you aren't already, you should know while it's free, it ain't cheap. I'd love to have you be a part of our online community, which is now going all the time on Discord. And you can sign up at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or just go to the paid subscription link in the show notes. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for joining me and know that you're not alone. You're never alone, especially now with the Discord platform where we're always talking in there on text, on voice, and even video. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Love you. Bye.